like to welcome everybody for coming. And I'd like to thank you for your support uh, of the Wings Club. Now, um, for those of you who I haven't met, uh, my name is Marlon Daly. I am uh, currently the, in, uh, I plan to stay, uh, the Chief Commercial Officer for, for AWOS. Uh, this is a, for those of you who aren't familiar with AWOS, AWOS is a, a reasonably large, we have about 300 airplanes, but we're in the commercial aircraft leasing business and we're based in Ireland. I'm also the, the chairman for the Wings Club European chapter. And so as, as part of my responsibility, it is sincerely a pleasure to welcome you here. Now, the Wings Club is, is based in New York, uh, but we do uh, support and we are committed to events like these around the world. Um, this is our fifth luncheon here in Geneva. It's been a great success. Um, it's always been centered around the, the eBase conference. And so that's worked extremely well. We also have a, an event in, in Dublin, Ireland, which we do on an annual basis. And then we have our monthly luncheons uh, in New York City at, at uh, the Yale Club. Um, in, in the fall, we always have an annual gala, which I think is uh, the industry premier event. Now, I just want to put out a, a, a sincere, you're welcome to participate in any and all of these events. And you can find us on our, our website. So I hope uh, to see you at future events. I would like to start out by, by welcoming our guest speaker, Robert Wells. Robert is CEO of, of TAG Aviation Holdings and TAG Aviation European Group. He is seated, seated right in front of me at the head table. I'll come back a little bit later and do a proper introduction before his remarks. But now I'd like to introduce the rest of the head table. Now, I'd appreciate it if we all hold our applause until we're finished with the introductions because the table is uh, somewhat large. We have at the table Ali Al Nakbi, uh, founding chairman of MEBAA. Ali. Uh, David, or Ed Bolin, uh, president and CEO of MBAA and Wings Club board member. We have Dave, David Davenport, Senior Vice President, Fly Safety International and Wings Club board member. Tom Fitzsimmons, General Manager of the Wings Club. He's what makes things work. Uh, Brian Humphreys, President of EBAA. Napo Han, CEO, CETA Aviation. Ali Rizzi, Etihadia, CEO, Freestream Aircraft Limited. Mark Johnstone, Managing Director, BAA Aviation Flight Support. Marwan Kalik, CEO, Gamma Aviation. Dave Paddock, Senior Vice President, Business Development and Strategic Planning, Jet Aviation. John Rossan Vallon, President and CEO, Dassault Falcon and Wings Club Board Member. I would also like to call out um, one of our, one of our uh, key WINGS members, Greg Thomas, who's sitting at table 13. Um, he's CEO of Private Air, ex-chairman of the European chapter and WINGS Club board member. Also today, I, I have, we have a, di a distinguished guest with us today, and we are honored to have him here. He's at the Universal table. He is uh, His Excellency Shaukat Azizi, former Prime Minister of Pakistan. Thank you for joining us. So after our event today, uh, we'll be, um, after the, the talk, we'll be uh, handing out a, a door prize. That door prize has actually uh, been donated to um, the Wings Club by, by the AWAS company, um, yours truly. Now, I really wanted it to be an ACJ, but all I have uh, is an Airbus A320. And all you experts out there in the BizJet world might be able to tell me externally, what is the difference? Uh, but we'll save that for, for after dinner. Uh, but for now, I'd just like you to, to enjoy your dinner. And I'll be back shortly to welcome and introduce Rob. Bon appetit. <laughs> Now, uh, we are also um, really delighted that Rob accepted our invitation to be our, our guest speaker at this uh, luncheon event. 
Uh, as you all know, Rob, uh, he's well established, really doesn't need much of an introduction around this group. CEO of TAG Aviation Holdings and uh, TAG, TAG, or TAG Aviation Europe. Uh, TAG Aviation is, is recognized, as we all know, as, as a world leader in private uh, and business aviation services. Uh, their origins uh, start back uh, some 45 years to, to the very beginning of business jet aviation. TAG provides aircraft management, charter services, maintenance services worldwide. Now, Rob joined uh, TAG's aviation business in the United States back in 1999, and, and obviously they, they knew they, they had something special. He moved very quickly, and in 2002, he was named President and CEO of TAG Aviation Europe. He is currently responsible for, for TAG's aviation's six operating companies, some 1,200 employees, and a fleet of 150 jets based on every continent. Impressive. Prior, prior to the time at TAG, Rob served in leadership positions at Piedmont Hawthorne and Beach Aircraft. He is, he is a current board member of the European Business Aviation Association and a former board member of, of NATO. Uh, Rob is also an FAA transport pilot with type ratings in several aircraft. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Rob Wells. Thank you. I'm not um, accustomed to doing this, but l let me first uh, thank Greg Thomas. Greg asked me to speak um, at, at, this, at this luncheon today, and I was at first gratified, but later, knowing Greg's sense of humor, I said, maybe, this is, maybe I'm being a little paranoid, but maybe this is his way of getting one over me right at the end. <laughs> also, when pre preparing these remarks, I reviewed some earlier Wings Club speeches and I decided that this being my last year in an executive role in, uh, at uh, TAG Aviation and also here in Europe, and by the way, I'm not entirely retiring, but perhaps it's time to do something just a little bit different. And I especially wanted, uh, one of the things that's really useful at this time is that when you get to this point in your career, you're not so concerned about downside risk if you say something inappropriate. <laughs> so I will call this reflections and commentary from an American in Europe. And one additional thought is also a call to action, and I'll get to that later. I gave this a lot of consideration. I thought perhaps I could sort of riff on the American in Paris theme. And then I imagined that it's unlikely that the possibility of a song and dance for me would be, would be too much for you to imagine. I also contemplated, peut-être une raison, en français pour mes collègues de Suisse Romand et France, and then I could imagine John Rosavallon saying, Rob, you're not, you're not fooling anybody. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's a true statement despite six years of French lessons. And then this morning, I thought about a conversation I had earlier this week with Ron Duncan, the chairman of NBAA. And he's an owner of a telecom business in Alaska and an avid aviation person. And it brought back some memories, actually some, some uh, very nice memories. It was just about this time of year in 1972 I was a young air taxi pilot in southeastern Alaska flying a Cessna 185 between Juneau and a fishing village about 30 minutes away. It was 10 o'clock at night, and by the way, it wasn't night. It was still light because it's Juneau. And I had an aircraft full of inebriated Native Americans, several of whom wanted to fly, and they wanted to fly on that lake. <laughs> I learned an important lesson that night about resourcefulness. And that is, if you can climb to 6,000 feet with any human who is that intoxicated, they will sleep like a baby. <laughs> I never forgot the experience or the lesson in thinking outside the box when confronted with a new challenge. And that applies to coming to Europe. From that time in Southeast Alaska, I never could have imagined that I could end up here today with you and having a chance to look back on that moment. I've been very fortunate to live in Europe for 12 years and work in an industry during a period of unprecedented growth. For the first 35 years of my career, the European market had perhaps 7% of the world's business aircraft and only a handful of operators, most of whom owned their chartered aircraft. 2002 was a pivotal time when I came here. 
I arrived in September of that year, only, sh only a short period after TAG bought the venerable Geneva-based company Aero Leasing, which came to be the first pillar of what is today TAG Aviation. While Aero Leasing was an operationally sound company, it's safe to say that rigorous financial reporting was not a top priority, at least not at the time that uh, it was purchased. My boss and a very good friend, Roger McMullen, was grappling with the start of Farnborough Airport, at a large project, as you know, and also trying to understand TAG Aviation SA. And we had just entered the post-9-11 recession. I remember Roger coming into my office one day in early 2003 and saying, you know, Rob, if I'd known how bad this was, I would have never recruited you. <laughs> but thank goodness for ignorance, <clears throat> because I don't know what I could do without having a colleague with me to sort out this mess. And so it began. It's safe to say we sorted it. And more importantly, our company changed dramatically, just as the European, just as Europe experienced explosive business aviation growth. It soon became a hang on for the ride situation with frankly too many, too many things happening at once. It required resourcefulness and for me a willingness to quickly accept the different cultures, regulators, customers. It is important to note that this was not a multinational expat experience. Roger and I were the only Americans <coughs> working with French, Swiss, British, Spanish, and that was just the start. I can remember meeting Franck Modenier, the, our, direct, our director of maintenance at the time, who spoke only halting English, and with whom my limited French did no good whatsoever. Frank, who has since become the architect and leader of TAG Aviation Engineering, a large FBO, a large MRO, excuse me, here in Geneva, but that it, it has now developed an impeccable reputation, but that was now, and, that, and now we need to look at what it was like then. I had never set foot outside the United States until I was 42 years old. And now I had to find a way to work with this French guy. <laughs> Suffice it to say, we found ways to communicate well. And Frank has become not only a respected colleague, but also a good friend. And I gained invaluable experience and on-the-job training when it came to working with managers of different cultures. Interestingly, over the years, we've had good success in recruiting senior executives from, this, from the airline industry. And you'd probably say, well, that's a little unusual. But you have to realize that during the period of incredibly fast growth here in Europe. We could, didn't have the resources to draw on from within our industry. We had Graham Williamson, who runs our aircraft management and charter business here in Europe. He was the DEO of several European airlines. Brandon O'Reilly, who most of you know, who is the CEO of Tag Farnborough Airport, came from British Airways and United, and he successfully led Farnborough Airport to become the number one rated FBO in the last six consecutive years. Thank you, Wilson. Um, Carlos Gomez was hired from British Airways in Iberia. He dramatically changed TAG Aviation España and is now the CEO of our fastest growing business, which is TAG Aviation Asia. All this to say is it's been an amazing cultural and business experience for me. And I haven't even started to talk about the incredible, incredibly rich professional relationships that I've developed with my almost 1,200 TAG Aviation colleagues worldwide. And still, Today, there's just 15 Americans in this company, most of whom are pilots. Another important reflection has to be on eBase. I've been fortunate to serve on the board of EBAA for almost seven years, and I witnessed just, as, just how much a trade show can positively impact our industry. In 2002, I'm gonna give you some numbers here. 2002, we had 219 exhibitors, 532 booth spaces, and 4,800 people that attended. Today, this year, it will be over 13,000 attendees. Am I right, Ed? Okay, good. 482 exhibitors and over 2,000 booth spaces. So we've grown four times in terms of the area. It only happened because eBay's became an important event for this industry. More importantly, it gained a reputation for a show where business actually happened. New prospects came into the hall and they bought aircraft, services, and components. The byproduct of eBase is profit for EBAA, and that's profit meaning a contribution to the coffers of EBAA. EBAA at the time, this is 2002 and earlier, was a little bit of a shoestring organization, well established, but chronically short of cash, and worse yet, unable to effectively mount any kind of a meaningful effort as the ASA regulations were being developed. The proceeds from eBase have given EBAA the resources to gain an effective voice in rulemaking. 
but much more, but, but there's so much more that is needed. Fortunately, it's not financial resources. What's required is engagement and participation from you, which is the next part of my talk. Brian Humphreys, who was the former head of Shell Aviation and the longtime leader of EBAA, noted in a meeting last week, he said, Rob, business aviation for 30 years operated under the radar. It was too inconsequential for government and regulators to pay much attention to. That's not the case today. We are being systematically marginalized by airports, airlines, regulators, and the like. You are all aware that airport access is an issue, but you must know that it's becoming a big issue. And Europe doesn't have the scale of reliever airports that are found in the United States. There is a need to gain visibility and impact, or we will be dramatically impacted. Flight time limitations, many of you know about. It's one of the most politically charged battles in recent times. Pilots using unions versus airlines management. And we run the risk, due to collateral damage, we run the risk of being forced into a regulatory box that could seriously damage our business, unless we act. ETS, Environmental Trade Scheme, everybody know about that one? Unquestionably, the worst, worst legislation ever written by well-meaning people. It has, for the time being, been sidelined but we have to be part of the solution because this is not going away. There are other programs like CESAR, which is the Airspace Reconfiguration Project, in which we are a stakeholder in an incredibly complex and long-term process, one that is of crucial importance to, our, to aviation and our industry, but unfortunately it's also difficult to explain. There are also opportunities to change outdated rules, such as the commercial landing distance requirements most of you know about. It's a topic that, if successfully argued, could open up many, many airports to us. The list goes on and on about what we should be doing with EBAA and as an industry. And even though, as I said, we have the financial resources, it requires participation, and not just EBAA staff, it's all of us. This starts then with what I'd like to say is leading the charge. Ed Bolin, probably slightly envious of EBAA, because roughly 80% of our, of our members are, business air, are, are with operators. What that means is that most of the constituents are companies that have employees and pay taxes. We can stand up and be counted in the field of politics because we have compelling data and we have economics on our side. It's a real advantage here in Europe. But to be truly effective, we must have a common voice and a consistent message. As Brandon O'Reilly, our CEO at Farnborough Airport, once said when he was trying to get um, approvals through British government, he said, Rob, you have to have the six-minute six elevator speech. It has to come from a mantra from all of us. We need that six-minute elevator speech. And one, this has to be a speech that is interchangeable with local, national, and EU government. If I were to propose a mantra, it would be business aviation, is an indispensable segment of our air transport system. It's a bold, but it's also a very simple statement. Also, it happens to be true. When the non-industry press, we know who the non-industry press is, target us, it's about fat cats, it's about luxury lifestyle, um, supposed wasted corporate spending, elitism, we all know the story here. I've often pointed out it's just lazy journalism because it's not interesting, interesting to discuss how the fact that fly, that kind of flying, we know it exists, that kind of flying represents six, only 6% six of all business jet flights. We have to, dis, to, to turn the discussion to the fact that we are an essential transportation tool. Not to be overly simplistic, but we make decisions every day about transportation. I took my car to eBay's this morning, not the train. It would have cost less to take the train. It would have probably been, been more socially responsible to take the train. But no one questions the fact that I just couldn't get everything done today unless I took my car. There's no need to apologize for my decision because in fact, it is normal and it's unquestioned, an unquestioned part of the daily decisions that we all make, as is the case for the majority of business aviation flights today. Enough of philosophy although I do want to test you on the mantra later on. What can you do to ensure that we get the right kind of attention, 
And the key, part, the key part to all of this is becoming involved. And also, this is very important, don't run from the spotlight. On a small, on a small scale, and I'm gonna make a, um, a, a tiny commercial message here, but it's in the right vein, I hope. Tag Farnborough Airport, during a recent application process with Brit British government, made a number of key commitments, largely out of social responsibility. Brandon O'Reilly introduced the concept of Europe's first Chapter 4 only airport. For those of you from the US, Stage 4, Chapter 4. But it's about noise and it's about understanding that the local populace is sensitive to noise. He also committed to becoming carbon neutral by 2017. That is not a small undertaking. Farnborough also engages with the community, hosting almost weekly tours of the airport, speaking before at local schools with children and talking to them about careers in aviation. They also sponsor a solo course for a couple of worthy high school students every year. Graham Williamson, who heads up our aircraft management and charter business, has asked his managers to devote time to EBAA to provide the technical uh, assistance that's, a possi that's possible to influence the regulatory process. There's one person I should call out um, named Martina Becker, who works for Graham. She's our fuel manager. You would think, well, that's sort of a, that's probably a minor role here. But Martina became involved in the ETS debacle several years ago and gained invaluable insight and experience. Today, she's one of the few voices of business aviation at the incredibly important ICAO undertaking, which is looking to find a worldwide ETS solution. Even charities can be a place where we can do more. Graham's team has organized a Farnborough Air Show Challenge to raise money for a worthwhile charity. It's a three-day cycling event from Le Bourget to Farnborough, which Graham, I guess, gets repeated next year the other direction, right? <laughs> the idea is we're not running from attention, we're doing things that actually draw attention to us for the right reasons. As you can see, there are many opportunities, and if we're all committed to do something, let's remember here, we have a common goal. Lastly, I, lastly, I'd like to reflect on our industry in a very different way. It's about what makes us special, and perhaps more to the point, it's, it's why I'm pleased about the decision I made to go into this business. Recently, we've been doing an interviews for my replacement, and one of the candidates, when asked why he wanted to get involved with business, a business aviation company, said that he had worked in the automotive business, and he'd also worked in the airline component industry, and he said, it's just tough. I said, your customers want only one thing, and it's price-driven. Um, if you go out of business tomorrow, they know that there's somebody else behind them who will probably be able to offer a better price. And he said, you know, after 20 years, it just grinds you down. He said that business aviation in some ways, ways harkens back to the earlier times where relationships, service, integrity, perhaps made more of a difference. He said he was envious of those in business aviation he knew that they unquestionably work hard, but they also seem to have fun, and they truly enjoy what they do. I couldn't agree more, which is why I never dreamed of doing anything else in the good times or the bad times. There are many elements of our industry that remain, in some ways, almost unique. We've often said, I think many of you heard this, we're all customers and we're all vendors in this business, and it's true. But let me give you an interesting story, which is actually accurate. Marwan Kala, who's our, our head table, is the CEO of Gamma Aviation. Um, he's my competitor, and a very good one, I might add. He upholds standards, and he'll complete vigorously against TAG for a client every time. But we also exchange charter, client, charter trips all the time. It's a cooperative relationship. He's also TAG Farmer Airport's largest tenant, and he and I serve on the EAA board, EBA board for many years and we frequently talk about ways in which we can bring more influence to bear to support our industry. In this regard, he's a partner with a common interest. And then there are, there are other special moments which I feel are also unique to our industry. Last summer, one of the people closest to TAG, TAG was in need of a short notice medical transport in the US. TAG doesn't do business in the United States. So I called Marvin. I said, I can't give you an exact date I can't give you a time, and it's absolute, this has to be absolutely confidential. No one can know who the passenger is. Without hesitation, Marlon said, leave it to me. It's what we do for each other. That's what's unique about our business. 
This is an example of what our industry is about. It's competitors and vendors, but we're a family of professionals with ideals and a commitment to professionalism. But in many, many cases, we're also long-term friends. So from the perspective of someone with 40 plus years of business aviation experience, speaking to my industry colleagues is wonderful. But I want to also want to implore you to value what we have, and above all, spend a little time each day thinking about what you can do as an individual or as a company to do more to make our industry's future bright. Because you know what? We're in this together. Thank you.